actual value judgments inside this state concerning coal mining, strip mining, uh, as against environment, are made in the same political arena that we make all our other laws. And those are fierce battles. Uh, they are, they're counterposed to one another. They're people who, whose very economic livelihood is tied up with coal production and people whose very land is tied up with environmental protection and their, own, and their emotions and, and everything. It's a polarized thing. Uh, it's, like a, it's like a cattlemen's war in the West. It has all of the elements of a public social drama with the good guys and the bad guys. There is no in-between. You're either for us or against us. We now have about 90% of our energy reserves in coal, but only about 18% of the energy that we use comes from coal. And one inevitable major shift in the years ahead is away from oil and natural gas and toward coal. We want to be sure that when this shift is made, that a continuing substantial major portion of the coal to be used comes from the Appalachian region, from the eastern part of the United States. This is a coal uh, deposit that's precious to us. Labor is already concentrated here from past times. And although we have had a reduction in coal production in the last 10 years from about 157 million uh, tons a year in West Virginia down to about 110 million tons a year, I think the inevitable uh, future developments will be toward a heavier dependence and a higher production of coal. We have a legacy which will be short-lived, a fleeting legacy of fossil fuels. During the past century, we have been going through those fossil fuels at an increasing rate. By the early part of the 21st century, oil and gas will be gone or going. We will have to become more dependent on coal but over the course of the 21st century, we must find a long-term technological so uh, solution that will provide us with a substitute for fossil fuels when they permanently run out. For the next decade, we have only what we have at hand today. And that means that we are going to have to do two things in our national energy policy, conservation, fuel efficiency on the one hand, and switching to those fuels that are domestically available, notably coal, on the other. I think that's extremely important that in looking at the long-term energy needs of this country, and I think we've got to talk in 50 and 100 years as well as 5 and 10, we've got to look at the overall long-term effect it's going to have on southern West Virginia. I'd like to let Secretary Andrews respond to that. You're right. Uh, I can take you into, well, let's not say West Virginia, let's say another state and show you practices of many years ago where strip mining, uh, it, it looks like the aftermath of World War III. Uh, we were wrong, we erred, and now it's going to be very, very expensive to clean that up. I personally feel that there is no reason to strip mine when there's 130 years approximately of deep mineable coal in this country in the East and the West. If we can deep mine, which will provide about three times the number of jobs as strip mining will. If we can deep mine that coal, I think we ought to deep mine it before we strip it because the environmental consequences and the economic consequences ultimately, I think, are greater than if we deep mine the coal. Mr. Lloyd. Mr. President, I know that as chief executive officer of this country, your main concern is keeping our economy strong. There's just no doubt about it. As so goes the energy, so goes the economy. It's interesting to note that in the Wall Street Journal this past Monday, it said our energy use rose last year 4.8%. I think Secretary Andrews was quoted in this article. And I know that we, we have to conserve and we have to practice every conservative measure that there is no one demand that can be. At the same time, I don't think we can let up on the supply. And that as we 
go down the road in years to come. If we're going to enjoy the, the economy we enjoy today, if we enjoy sitting in a room with air conditioning, ample lighting, ample energy, we're going to have to increase that energy supply. Uh, we have a tremendous energy source uh, in this country in terms of coal one that outweighs uh, by far all of the oil reserves in the entire known world. We are independent. We can mine that coal uh, whether or not there's a war on. We have it here in our own backyard. We can do that. Every time we spend $20 for a ton of coal, we're spending it within this country. We're paying our own people who are in, are in turn going to go out and spend that twenty dollars to other americans whereas if we were to go out and buy a barrel of oil for twenty dollars that money is gone it's in the pockets of some sheik or or, or some fake or, here or something in, in in saudi arabia we're not going to see that money again unless we happen to get it back by selling them some jet planes so we we have a revolving type of, of monetary situation in this country where by for every dollar that I spend to get a, a, a ton of coal out, that dollar is going to be spent again and again and again, and it's got to help this economy. An awful lot of people in our country would be glad to have the benefits of more coal mining and never know nor worry about the consequences. Oh, if coal production is going to increase radically, as it may, as it may it's important for people who live in the coal field to insist that the environment be protected. I think the average citizen is unaware of the vast area that surface mining has disturbed in eastern and, and western Kentucky. You see a lot of it driving along the road and looking up on a mountain, yes. But then when you once can get up on a higher mountain and you look out and you see the yellow streaks back in the background all over, then you begin to realize just how much land that surface mining does cover. Uh, it's hard to believe the effects of contour stripping, especially on, on steep mountain slopes where there has been no control of the spoil that has been pushed over the outslope. It's not always the acid condition that we're thinking about when we're talking about uh, stream pollution, it's the sediment. And, uh, we've got muddy streams all over the place, and if you want to uh, fish in a clear running stream uh, down here in eastern Kentucky, you've got to go drive long distances to be able to find a fishing stream anymore. Mining started in this area some you know, around the turn of the century, and before that, it was pretty rural, fairly isolated, mostly kind of small farming and hunting and trapping, things of that sort going on here. So when the coal was discovered and the railroads came in, they began building coal camps. And coal camps sprung up all over the region, and they brought people in from all over. They even uh, went up to New York to the ports and brought in Italians and Greeks and, and Polish people to work in the mines. They went down south and brought lots of blacks in. And a lot of the miners came from neighboring farming areas and came into the camp scattered all over the area. Mining changed the whole way of life for people in the mountains. The way they related to the land, the whole kind of pattern of living, the whole rhythm of life changed when people started mining. You can see that somewhat in this area if you travel from one county to the other because you'll find a county that's mainly agricultural and the style in which people live and how they relate to the land is completely different from the adjoining county where it's coal mining. I think strip mining really came into its being in, uh, in the late 60s. There was some strip mining done uh, on, on a piecemeal basis up at that time. I think during the late 60s, there was an increased demand for coal. Uh, there were a lot of small property owners who had coal on their land and could not afford to open up 
uh, deep mines. The cost at that time for going into the deep mine was, was prohibitive uh, for a small operator. And you had people who did have surface equipment, tractors, uh, bulldozers, uh, even farm equipment, for example, that uh, they were using to take strip mine coal out. So I, I think this was, was, was the beginning of it. And at that time, it was a cheap way to pick up coal. The economics demanded that uh, strip mining was, was a viable way to go. But I think in the beginning, there was no regulation. People's main concern at that time in the stripping business was simply to get the coal out of the ground. In the late 60s, a lot of the states which mine a good deal of coal passed strip mine control laws that were supposed to be fairly strict. But uh, experience with them was very disappointing. And the damage from strip mining kept growing as the amount of strip mining kept growing. So that by the early 70s, there was a lot of very real despair in the coal fields that anything could be done with strip mining. Strip away big D9 dozer coming for to bury my home I'm getting mad as you're getting closer coming for to bury my home they're gonna turn our mountain homeland to acid clay coming for to bury my home to make a cheaper rate for the TVA strip mine control on a, on a federal strip mine bill were held in the fall of 71. And the hearings went on through 72. And the real basis for the pressure on Congress to do something about strip mining was the pressure from citizens groups in the areas that were directly affected, in, from the mountains of West Virginia and eastern Kentucky, from East Tennessee, and uh, then increasingly also groups from Montana, Wyoming, Arizona, as strip mining began out there in, in a significant way and as people began to realize what a terrific impact it would have on those parts of the country. The process was slow and difficult. Uh, one year we got a strip mine bill through the House and then it died in the Senate before uh, when the Senate adjourned without voting on it. Uh, the next year we got, I think it was 73, we got, uh, or 74, uh, we got a strip mine bill passed, uh, both houses of Congress, and uh, President Ford vetoed it. When, uh, when Carter was elected, uh, pledged to support a strip mine law, why then the bill went through Congress again in a fairly strong form, and the President signed it, and all uh, efforts at federal control of strip mining began. Let's start out this way with a, a contour strip job. Naturally, the first thing to confront the operator, the trees are on the land, the vegetation is on the land, and it, it has to be moved. They call it scalping. If there hasn't been somebody salvaged the timber, that is, come in ahead of the operation and sawed down all of the merciful timber, well, then uh, the bulldozer, he will push it down, and then he'll scalp it down in below the coal seam. Now, that has been the general procedure up to now, but the new federal law says that the, all the organic material has to be moved off of the area, and the topsoil saved. 
and you've got to make a dozer blade width road above the coal seam for the drill to run on. And then he drills down a line of holes, say maybe three to 400 foot in length. And they load and shoot this particular area. Then it's time for the end loader to come in with the dirt hauling trucks and start moving the overburden off. And this is a sort of a, a slow process, but with a great number of dirt moving trucks and a couple of end loaders, you can soon move a, a vast area. So when that is finally done, uh, you, you're down to the coal seam. And at the very minute you have the coal uncovered, by then the coal trucks move in and you use the end loader to load up the coal trucks. Then, of course, you advance ahead with the same method, another 300 feet, and you take all of that overburden that's over the coal, and you move it back and eliminate the high wall in the section from where you have just taken the bit of coal. So it's a matter of taking a cut and then completing that and then moving on to another cut all the way around the mountain. And that is the process in contour stripping. This job is a very good example of what the new federal regulations will be asking for on all areas in where contour stripping is being done. During the mining operation, the terrain is uh, completely devastated to as much as 100 feet deep. This means that uh, primary minerals are brought from well beneath the earth's surface up to the surface, and this certainly completely changes the existing ecosystem. We know that the soil microflora and fauna is completely done away with. The hydrology may have been completely changed. Generally, we figure on complete replacement of the primary and secondary elements necessary for plant growth. We also know that the structure is uh, completely changed. Uh, we can put the soil back on the surface, but uh, we cannot change the subsurface structure and we know that the uh, plant roots do go to a depth greater than uh, 6 to uh, 12 inches, which is the normal amount of topsoil that would be replaced. A good mining method certainly will enhance the possibility of reclamation. If the mining is carried out in a haphazard fashion, then our reclamation can be very difficult or almost impossible. We're going to have people that uh, know what to do to keep the water from being polluted. Uh, we have people that uh, know what kind of grasses and legumes and what kind of trees will grow on this particular piece of land. So as long as we're getting better educated in those fields and getting that type of people on the job. I look for us to do a real good job in protecting the environment. And if we can do that and stick with the new state regulations and the abide by the new federal regulations, I feel like that uh, the environment is going to be much better place for all of us to live in in eastern Kentucky and all of the other mountain states. This program overall uh, is going to more or less prove that there is a right way and it can be done. I hate to sound pessimistic, but even with the recently enacted Federal Service Mine Act behind us, the future for abuses of strip mining in Virginia looks pretty good. I think that cooperators in Virginia 
uh, I don't know if it's majority, minority, but whichever, they're going to try the federal government out on every front and push and shove the federal government to the, to the breaking limit, and the result's going to be more abuse and maybe a lot more devastated streams and homes to contend with because cooperators are going to be testing the federal government on every level, even when it would cost them less to comply with the Federal Strip Mine Act. It's just a tradition here with the coal industry. A lot of people who like to brag about uh, reclamation in Virginia point to the grass and trees that they've planted on a so-called reclaimed site. But uh, I've made a comparison to planting grass on a Virginia surface mine as being the same as putting lipstick on a corpse. It's just a little bit too late. The new Federal Surface Mining Act and the attendant regulations have been analyzed by the Office of Surface Mining in terms of the projected economic impact, the cost of complying with them. And their own analysis shows that the cost impact on coal uh, in eastern Kentucky, indeed in all of central Appalachia, will be approximately five times greater than in any place else in the United States where they estimate that nationwide the cost of compliance uh, with the new federal requirements will only add 50 cents a ton to coal and incidentally that's just some of the cost impacts. In Appalachia it'll be two dollars and fifty cents. No matter what that dollar amount is, it'll make central Appalachian coal then less competitive where it has to compete with production areas with lower costs. I'm not a mining inspector. I'm a coal miner. And I want to work. But under these regulations, are putting us all out of work. Well, there's a lot of things. Any damn thing they want to find, they can find it. It don't, it don't have to be no one law. They can stop you on anything without a, even a hearing. You get no hearing, you don't get nothing. If you, you were going to change the law, what would you change? Well, we ought to have a hearing. If we're violating, we ought to have a chance to uh, fix the thing and go ahead and work. Instead of just coming up and y'all are done. And here we are down here begging to work. We're, we don't want no damn food stamps or no welfare. We want to work. And we're well, going we to work. To we're them. going to work. Do you, do you think that uh, uh, operators will withhold their severance tax money if there isn't a resolution passed? We won't hold it. We'll just keep it. We'll spend it. We'll have to <laughs> if we survive. We'll, we'll use her and let them come up there. We're going to buck them. That's what we're going to do. We're going to buck them. How do you expect to do that? Any way it takes. We tried to be good, and we are good, but we, want them, we don't want them to think that we're too damn good. We're going to buck them. That's what I say to them. Well, I'm opposed to strip mining because I think it's a very destructive and disruptive way of getting coal out of the earth. And the next thing I would like to see is tough laws. Um, so. They're asking for more lenient laws, so no, I don't really, I'm not particularly, you know, in sympathy with them. I'd, I'd like to see them put out of business. There is a built-in tension between uh, the demands, the economic demands for coal and for wages and for gainful employment and, and all that sort of thing. And the, and the similarly intense demand for a clean environment, for uh, saving the streams, and for protection of the, of the land where you live. It's just, been, there's a built-in problem there. Where to stop OSM from uh, stopping their strip mining in eastern Kentucky, raising the price of coal, and running all the independent strip miners out of business? But I think we need the laws. We don't need them as tough as we got them. But uh, we definitely need laws to go by. Uh, when you say 100% haul back, 
that's not uh, it's not bad. We need to haul this material back instead of putting it over the hill all around it. Have one place to put it over. But we, we ought to be allowed to have 10 or 15 percent to go over. That way when you put off shot, if a few rocks fall over the hill, we're not in violation. The way it is now, if, uh, if a tree just falls over the hill, we're in violation and they can shut us down. We got all these men here trying to work and all these payments to make. Uh, we we got to work. Things are pretty tough. Try to make a dollar. Uh, we got about 16 men working here and uh, all operators gets about $9 an hour. They make around a hundred dollars a day. Then we got seven coal trucks hauling coal. We pay them two dollars a quarter a ton. So they uh, they make a lot of money. These maybe forty thousand dollars a month we pay in taxes to the state and uh, government on tax on coal. So there's a lot of money put in circulation from a small strip job like that. Uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars a month is spent here. Yeah. So if it wasn't for strip jobs, 50% of the workforce in Bletcher County wouldn't have anything to do. And people don't want to go away. Uh, they can make more money here than they could have uh, in another state, uh, at a factory. The uh, total economic impact of coal and coal production on Kentucky is almost incalculable. Uh, the direct, primary, and secondary wages uh, are tremendous inside uh, this state. In eastern Kentucky, it is the primary industrial activity. It is the primary activity uh, involving employment of substantial numbers of people. And uh, absent coal production in eastern Kentucky, there is no other economic base that I know of. Prior to this current coal boom, which really began in uh, about 1973, people who have been around this state will recall that the primary industry in eastern Kentucky was welfare, was a collection of welfare benefits in one form or another. There were no jobs. When I was a little boy, my mom told me not to, uh, the one thing she didn't want me to do was to coal mine because she'd seen people killed in deep mines and she'd seen what strip mines were starting to do. So that's the one thing she didn't want me to do. So when I grew up, graduated from high school, I had to go to the city to look for a job. And uh, I found out that I had too much mountain blood in me. I found out that I had to live in these mountains. When I come back here, the only, the only kind, of, kind of a job that could be found was in these coal mines. And so that's what I'm working now, is the deep mines. The reason I come back to these mountains was uh, that I felt we had more than the, the people in the cities, the people that, that were out here just without any roots. That, that may be the big thing there, the roots that we have here, except we're tearing them up. I don't think that uh, deep mining does that much, uh, that much destruction as a strip mine does. I've seen... Uh, I've seen them tear up land that personally belonged to me, and I've seen them tear up land that, that belonged to my friends, and friends of my friends. When great riches can be made from mining coal, then the more modest uh, gains that can be made from the land in other ways are less appealing, and a coal operator can look at a mountain and can say, it's not worth anything except for the coal. Ignoring the timber, ignoring the game, ignoring the water, which is increasingly precious, ignoring all the recreational potential, ignoring just the, the joy of having it there. All these things don't have a monetary value anywhere close to the value of the coal.
And so he can say it's, it's worth nothing except to get the coal out. The life of strip mine this favor for small companies is short. But then uh, big companies that come in here, I believe they'll level these mountains down. They'll take them off. Uh, it'll almost be level land uh, in 50 years, 50, 75 years from now. They have to have this coal. I believe these mountains will be level. In time they go, uh, They'll be able to strip three, four hundred feet after seeing the coal. I think strip mine is here to stay. People just have to get used to it. And these mountains, ah, uh, they ain't no good, really. I think there's a fascination, particularly with the development of strip mining, the development of large machinery. Uh, there's a kind of a technological fascination and how much earth you can move and how big a boulder you can push over the side of a hill and how much change you can make in order to get the coal out of the ground. And so the, the very technologies that produced greater and greater devastation were to many of the, of the operators, both management and the workers who worked the machines, were increasingly fascinating and in a certain way satisfying to be able to get up there and with giant machines to take this mountain and completely rearrange it, uh, cut it open, cast it aside and get the coal underneath. Uh, there's responsibility but I also believe that uh, a landowner should have a say-so in what happens on his property. If he wants uh, a bench left there, if he wants it leveled off, I think he should have a say-so if they can control the uh, spoil, the runoffs. I definitely think the property owner should have a say-so there. Pe people in this region that have to live and look at this every day. Usually, the biggest proportion of them aren't the ones that own the land. Usually, the land's owned by the, well, your politicians, your businessmen, just whatever, your, your people that had money before and still are trying to make money with that money. And uh, I really believe that the people in this, in this region aren't really getting, getting a say-so as to uh, what they think about it. We have a tradition in our society that if a person owns land, he can do with it pretty much what he wants. Uh, that's a tradition which causes a great deal of damage, and coal operators, among others, uh, lean on that tradition uh, when what they want to do is going to be damaging of the land and the life on the land have no real rights in our society. I think they should, but they don't. And those who ignore their rights are, are in a mainstream tradition in our, in our society, which has been very exploitive over history. For a regulatory agency like ours, the most troublesome uh, sector in the coal industry is the outlaws. The next ones that are the most trouble are usually the small ones. They're undercapitalized. They do not have access to good engineering services in the first place. Uh, the whole set of new requirements is new to them, new techniques new and demanding ways of uh, protecting the environment and handling earth and monitoring water and that sort of thing. And they're running along behind. 
they are still mining the way they did 10 years ago. And uh, they're caught in the grip of mining for the spot market, which means they have to mine quickly, get the coal on the market quickly, otherwise they don't get paid. They don't have the leisure of planning a mining operation to run out there five years and gathering up the equipment and leisurely mining it. They need two and a half permits a year, where a big mining operation won't need but one every two years, simply because they mine on short notice, a quick turnover, and that's the way they stay in business. Oh, well, you got, you're under a lot of pressure, uh, a lot of different ones, dealing with the property owners one, uh, dealing with the state and the government uh, on their laws. Then moving that material is, uh, you're under a lot of pressure there. Is can you move it? Can you afford to move it for the, what you're going to get out of the coal? There's a lot of people uh, uh, try to strip mine and don't make it. There's more that don't make it than it does. You got to understand uh, how to move material and, and move it cheap. To do our job and at the same time to do our job whereby we're not going to uh, wreck the environment, where we're not going to siltate the, uh, the rivers, where we're not going to cause uh, massive landslides. And uh, that is a lot of pressure, especially when, you know, you have to consider that at the end of every week I have to make a payroll, at the end of every month I have to make equipment payments. Uh, the, to do all that and still try to, to take care of the environment is, is a very tough job. A vice president of one of the large coal operations once said to me that he had two responsibilities. One was to get the coal out of the ground as cheaply and efficiently as he could, and the other was to make a profit for the stockholders. When it came to any of the other responsibilities relating to the community or the environment or people, that was not his responsibility. And that was not his mission. Uh, that is really the basic principle of our economic system, whereby profit motive is really important. And if you don't make a profit on something, you don't do it and you do everything you can to make a profit, which is cutting corners and so forth. This may work all right if you're inventing something or producing something that is not damaging to either the environment or the people, but when you are dealing with natural resources, which are very essential to the welfare of the whole country and to the people who live in the area, then it can be devastating all the kind of social costs then are left for somebody else to bear, the taxpayers to bear, the citizens to bear, and are not counted into the cost of production. I think in the long term, there isn't a conflict between economic interest and environmental interest because over the long run, human society depends on a healthy environment. In the short run, there is almost always a conflict and it always seems like the cost of correcting an environmental abuse is excessive to the people having to pay for it right now. Of oh, this short-run economic interest of oh, will, I think, continue to have too much influence in our society as long as our concern for the environment is confined to thinking about human benefit only. The land is to be used. My personal belief is God uh, gave us these minerals, they gave us this timber, they gave us this limestone, they gave us this coal, they gave us this oil, they gave us this gas. I think we ought to use it. I think there, it, uh, I, I think it would, uh, would violate God's law, I think it would violate nature if we didn't use it. And it's in the ground, let's get it out. Because if we do it that way, we're using our own people, we're using American labor, we're using our own talents, and I think probably the finest technology in the world to, to get this energy out. I say there have to be other ways. Uh, we, we have to find other ways of uh, energy supplies without destroying the country for a few paltry tons of coal. These, uh, they rip this coal out of here, they destroy this timber. This timber is gone. It is gone. There is no way what has been destroyed here can ever be put back. 
they may s smooth the land up and sow a little grass on it and finally get the grass to grow or a few other little things, but it'll never be the same. It'll never have what it did have. Everything is, all of the, uh, all of the old seed timber is gone. All of the seed that were dropped by the old timber and the old plants, they are all gone. Everything is gone. Whatever is, is back here, or what, whatever this amounts to, will be something that's been restored, not restored really, but uh, replaced, replaced. And it'll be something else. It's just, just a doing away of the old government and big business has been able to persuade people that this is what's best for the economy and best for the people. All you have to do is just look on the mountain to know that it's not best for the people. In modern day America, it has come to be a polarization matter. Uh, strangely enough, I don't really see how people divorce themselves from the other side. The very self-same people uh, who, who, who speak of environmental values are the very people who consume the products that our economy generates for them. They live the good life. They reach up and turn a switch and the electricity comes on. Well, there's not a magic electricity ferry around. It's made by some power plant someplace that feeds on coal or nuclear uh, fuel or uh, something or other. It is, uh, it is the same kind of tension in our society uh, that we've had at other times in the past, but now it seems almost as if it's a holy war sometimes. Now, the one thing we know about holy wars is that, that uh, all heretics get killed. Uh, there is no middle ground. You're either a true believer or you're not. Uh, if, you're an, if you're an industry spokesman, then all the folks on that side of the table are evil and they're trying to stop you and destroy America's uh, economy. If you're an environmentalist and all of these uh, captains of labor over here are trying to despoil the countryside and etc., the truth of the matter is this sum of both kinds of folks on both sides. The bulk of Kentucky's coal is used to produce electricity. And the bulk of that is used to produ produce electricity for us. We burn our own coal. Uh, a substantial amount of it is sold outside the state. We, we have an enormous surplus production. And it, in turn, goes to electrical generating companies, largely, and usually those in the Midwest, those directly north of us, are the big purchasers of our coal. They are, in the final analysis, getting the benefit of the coal in the form of electricity to heat their houses and light them and, do, and have all the modern benefits. They ought to, they ought to pay the economic value of whatever it is they get. If the society wants us to protect Kentucky's hillsides by raising the cost of production of coal, then society ought to help us pay for it. We shouldn't bear the burden. Exact, that's a precise point. In the past, Kentuckians bore 100% of the cost of coal production in the form of despoiled land. I think it is a fair price if Detroit wants to be warm for us to get clean hillsides. We're going to have to do something about a technological system which is requiring ever increasing amounts of natural resources per person to keep this country going. Uh, we're using more and more coal, more and more electricity, oil, uh, metals, everything. Not only in absolute terms, but uh, more and more per person each year. And this. The, the pollution, the devastation, the consequences of strip mining, the storage of chemicals underground, uh, all of this is, is now coming back to haunt us in serious ways. Something has to give. Uh, it's not easy to, to reverse this process and to begin to use less or even to stop the escalating growth of our use of materials and energy. It's important for 
consumers to understand that their increasing demands for energy are creating havoc in other parts of the society, havoc which will ultimately come back to haunt them or their children. This is not an urban area, and you would think that people would be very close to the land. Many of them are. But mining tends to disassociate people from the land because they have to consider the land in a very different fashion. It's no longer a place that sustains them, in which they live, but it becomes something to exploit and something to sell. And this produces a real different kind of feeling about the land and about living on the land. I think this has happened to all of us in this country as we have become more consumer oriented, more industrialized. It's probably one of just the problems of industrial society. But if we are probably going to save our planet, we're going to have to think backwards and begin to make some kind of kinship with the land and understand the role of the earth in sustaining us. Just because you own a piece of land doesn't mean that it really belongs to you. Someday, you, someday you're not going to be here and that piece of land is going to be here. Someday we're going to all have to go and give another generation a chance. And I'm, I'm really sorrowful, but I really think that what we're going to be leaving them isn't going to be that much.